Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy that um, I can be here to answer some of your further questions. Um, many of you have taken the course. I also see in the chats um, and um, I also got, got notified that you uh, already finished or completed the course. And I'm pretty sure you have some questions, uh, probably have answered some of those questions on Udemy as well. Um, and actually, I'm really excited to, to answer them uh, in today's session as well. Uh, I'm just going to maybe set like a context, kind of explain to you what today's session is going to be about. I just have one uh, slide, but I'm going to share that with you as well. So basically, uh, I've created this course uh, about logging in Kubernetes, which I think is a very common uh, use case. Um, however, it is also one of the uh, complex use cases um, because I have like when I have set up a FluentD and just generally logging in Kubernetes, I, I remember it was a very complex process of not only just technically setting this up inside the Kubernetes cluster, like uh, working through the FluentD documentation and trying to figure out how what works, but also um, because of talking with a lot of different parties involved. So talking to the developers of how they should log the stuff, talking to the IT operations of what they want to be logged by applications to check and monitor that security standards are met inside the applications and what application logic they want to be logged and all this stuff. And then of, of course, set the, the whole thing up. So that's why I actually decided to um, do this uh, entry level course, like to just get an idea of how this uh, works in inside Kubernetes um, and how to do this with EFK cluster, which actually is the, the standard um, more or less, at least now for, for Kubernetes logging. Um, and in th this session basically is for clarifying some of the questions that you still have after the course. Uh, maybe you have already used it at work in your own projects, or maybe you have just tried it around and um, got stuck somewhere, didn't understand something. So I'm happy to hear your feedbacks, first of all, on the on the course. Um, and of course, um, we'll be happy to answer um, all of your questions, hopefully, hopefully most of your questions. So you can just write the questions in the chat and um, I will answer them. Okay, so I think we have the first question. Probably I'll go to the question and then hand it over to you, Nana. Yes. So the question from Rohit is, uh, what is the difference between the aggregator and a forwarder in Fluentd? So um, you have you have a basic setup of Fluentd, right? So imagine a simple scenario. You have a very small or medium-sized application, and you have, let's say, three nodes, right? Three worker nodes for your Kubernetes. And uh, Fluentd is a daemon set, which means it's going to run automatically on every single worker node, right? So you have three nodes with th three Fluentd um, pods running on each node. This is not a very complex setup, right? So you have... Um, one, like three pods in total in a cluster. So you don't need any special complex setup here, right? So in this case, you can, you can actually have just one, could be forwarder. So a forwarder and aggregator in one pod, so to say, right? So forwarder is a fluent D uh, agent, so to say, that um, takes in the logs. So events, logs, etc. An aggregator is basically something that collects those uh, logs. And in this case, you have both in one. Now, if imagine if you have 100 nodes, right? So now you have Fluentd instances, hundreds of them on each node. In this case, you may need some kind of high availability. What happens if one node dies? Now, you, don't, you have all the logs and all the events are gone, right? On that log, so uh, on the node. So you lose all this data. So for this scenario, they actually came up with this architecture where they divided the roles of collecting the logs and then uh, forwarding it right away to an aggregator. An aggregator is basically one pod or two pods 
in the whole cluster, not per node, but just inside the cluster. And that aggregator is basically getting these logs from all different um, Fluent pods from the worker nodes, and then doing the processing, right? So all the processing, parsing the logs, et cetera, happens in the aggregator, and then the aggregator will send them to Elasticsearch or some other uh, backend. So the so the the reason they divided is uh, was because of this complex high availability setup and etc. And these are just different roles. Uh, and in in this course, um, you saw that we have this Helm chart which deploys both. So we have an aggregator in the cluster and a forwarder per node. Um, and in the configuration, we actually or in the course. I actually configured only the forwarder because it was just a setup with, I think, two nodes, three nodes we had. So there was no need for, for aggregator. Yeah, so that's the, that's the different, uh, difference. Oh, brilliant. I'll be honest, I've been using Fluentd for ages, and that was a brilliant explanation. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. I'll ask the folks to add the questions in the question box if they can. I see there are one or two in the chat as well. So probably I'll go to the next one if you're okay with that, Nana, in the chat. Yeah. Um, yes. So the question is from Maiden. I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. And the question is, why use Fluentd if you have file bead and all out of the box advantages in Elasticsearch stroke Kibana? If you use file bead, uh, generally, what is the what is pros and cons using Fluentd versus file bead? Um, so the, the the general difference could be also described uh, EFK versus ELK, right? So we have we have this famous ELK stack, which is all these three parts of logging from Elasticsearch, right? We have um, uh, Elasticsearch, Kibana, and Logstash. Um, so we can also compare Logstash and, and Fluentd. Um, so Logstash has, uh, of course, advantage of being automatically part of this Elastic uh, stack, so to say. Um, however, Fluentd was actually made uh, specifically for Kubernetes and is also more optimized for Kubernetes. Um, I mean, the first fact is that they both come from the same uh, same uh, organization. They both uh, belong to or are maintained by uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, so Kubernetes and Fluentd project both. Um, uh, Fluentd also has an advantage of storage, actually. Um, I think that its storage is much more, um, and also generally its features, it's much more fit to how Kubernetes works. Like you have automatic plugin um, to from Docker engine, you have automatically uh, the Kubernetes metadata enrichment in the Fluentd plugin. So you don't have some of this stuff uh, for Logstash, for example. I think Filebit is the lightweight version of Logstash. So I would actually uh, compare Filebit to Fluentbit, which is um, the lightweight version of Fluentd, actually. Uh, so, I, I mean, I have... Uh, I haven't set up Logstash in Kubernetes. We have used it um, and I have just replaced it because we saw that Fluentd was more, um, uh, from the features and configuration was more fit to how Kubernetes and Docker work. Um, and also you don't need, like you don't need external uh, storage like Redis or some other uh, in-memory database to, uh, to store the logs, for example, until they are um, uh, sent to the backend. So it has a couple of advantages, especially in the Kubernetes setup. Yeah, brilliant. Ooh, nice. I can see more questions flowing in. So I'll go line by line uh, to the next one. And hopefully if folks, if you think your question was answered, but missed something, post a question again, follow up questions. If you have like just start posting as many as you want. I think none is ready for the <laughs> questions. Um, so moving on to the next one then, um, and this is an interesting one. So can Fluentd be used as a sidecar? If yes, is it better than running it as a daemon set? Um, I mean, I don't think it makes sense to run it as a sidecar because sidecar container is inside a pod, right? Inside a specific pod. So uh, uh, um, I wouldn't know in which pod 
it should run as a sidecar because I mean it has its own functionality. It's it is kind of the main application, uh, not like helper application. And also it's it's uh, FluentD pod is actually doing stuff per node, so it makes sense to have it available in the node and not um, as a helper inside some uh, application pod. I don't think there is a setup as a sidecar um, FluentD to be honest. No, and I think uh, the only sidecar logging patterns that I have seen in the past is when, let's say, you have a traditional application which can't log to standard out, and it's writing to yes. a file, you would run something like a Fluent bit as a sidecar, which can then stream yeah. it to D. Yeah, yeah, that, that would make sense if the application can't, can't log it, or maybe it can log in a, in a proper format. Yeah, cool. Yeah. That makes sense. Cool. I think that answers that one. And next one is from Atit. And I think it's it's just a very simple question, which you might have answered already, but maybe just round it off again. So it's just, why can't we just use Elk Stack? I mean, you can use El Elk Stack. Um, I think the, um, I mean, first of all, you will need um, uh, Redis or some other like uh, storage in memory um, uh, database with it so you have another application that you have to deploy so to say and you will have to do more configuration for example uh as i mentioned like kubernetes metadata right so every log entry uh um has information where it comes from which pod the pod id namespace and so on and this could be actually very important information if you do like uh, um, cross application search for the logs so you have this kind of stuff out of the box in FluentD. Um, you can configure it in Logstash, but just a um, little bit more effort. Yeah, brilliant. Awesome. Uh, hopefully that answers that one. So the next one is uh, as we deployed, and I'm going to apologize now, I haven't done the course, so I don't know if this was part of the course, but Sampath is asking as we deployed Elasticsearch as a stateful set. I see a service called headless service uh, that is created. May I know what it is used for? Sure. So every stateful set has a headless uh, service. So you have a normal service, like a standard service, which is a load balancer. So uh, basically in Kubernetes, we have this uh, concept of services. So you don't have to directly t talk to the pods, right? Because pods have IP addresses and not the DNS. Um, names, so you can only uh, uh, talk to them through the IP address. And the service is kind of like a, a fixed IP address for the pods, but also a, a DNS endpoint. So you can talk to the application. If you have a replicated application, like uh, Elasticsearch, for example, we have uh, three replicas. Uh, you talk to uh, the application of Elasticsearch through this load balancer service. So you just have one endpoint, right? So this is for scenarios where you need uh, reads from the database, right? You don't care which pod is gonna read because every pod, uh, every Elasticsearch pod can uh, execute a read operation, right? This doesn't change the database. And then you have a write, write uh, operation. In stateful sets, because of this data consistency, only one pod is allowed to change the database or write to the database. Uh, this is usually the master pod in Elasticsearch. The first pod uh, with the index zero, this is gonna be the master pod and only one who can write, right? So in this case, if you are performing a write operation, right? So your application web server is talking to Elasticsearch, please write this log entry um, in the Elasticsearch. You have to talk to the master. So in this case, you need, uh, to address the pods individually. You don't want to talk to a load balancer that randomly then distributes the request. You want to talk to the master directly. And that's what the headless service is. So headless service gives the DNS identity to each individual pod. So you have both. You have the load balancer service and you, have, you can talk to the pods directly as well. Brilliant. Um, <clears throat> And I think uh, next one is from Niranjan. Um, and I know you touched on file beat versus FluentD, but this is more of a like a log stash comparison with FluentD. So what is the difference between log stash and FluentD? Yeah, um, 
<laughs> uh, I was actually expecting the, the this uh, question. So, um, as I mentioned, Logstash, I mean, Logstash, everyone knows it's part of the official um, Elastic stack, right? So it comes from Elastic. And of course, Advantage, because it integrates well with Elasticsearch, Kibana, it's, a, it's a, like a package. But as I said, in Kubernetes, it's actually um, more optimal to use FluentD because of how FluentD integrates with Kubernetes, right? So you have the stack, Elasticsearch stack, uh, these three components of logging, the collecting, visualizing, uh, storing that work well together. But they also have to work well with the Kubernetes, right? With Docker, because the logs are read from, uh, from the Docker engine, right? Um, so the FluentD difference between the FluentD and Logstash is that FluentD integrates well better with Kubernetes and Docker. So you have a lot of things out of the box. You have the enrichment of uh, the log entries uh, from Kubernetes tags. You have, um, uh, as I said, the storage. Uh, storage is just uh, better because you have inbuilt storage mechanism in FluentD. For example, you have this buffering that you can configure per uh, backend backend meaning Elasticsearch, InfluxDB, MongoDB, whatever store, like a uh, log storage backend you have. Um, and you can configure buffer um, to be like uh, in memory or in disk. So what happens is with in FluentD, uh, you have the, the logs collected and FluentD writes them to disk before sending that to um, to the backend. So if something happens, right, if the server dies, if, um, um, or restarts, uh, not dies completely, if the FluentD pod itself uh, dies or if the backend is unavailable, right? Could be that Elasticsearch uh, just went down, it's not accessible. So FluentD will buffer that data and it will. It also has inbuilt um, retry mechanism, right? So it will check is Elasticsearch uh, up again uh, or it, when the FluentD comes up again, if the FluentD pod itself died, it will read the buffer and we say, okay, I have this data that I have to send to the backend. So you don't lose the log data. In Logstash, you will have to configure that with a another application. As I said, you have to have like um, Redis or some, um, some other mechanism. But also if Redis dies, then again, you don't have the log data uh, available. Um, what it, for example, another thing that I find it much more convenient in FluentD is the routing. So um, FluentD is, with FluentD is very easy to route um, er, any combination of um, uh, to any combination of backends. So you have multiple uh, inputs, right? So you have different input sources. You have the file. You have maybe you are collecting data from HTTP endpoint, whatever. And then you can decide very easily where to route which log data to, right? Maybe you have Elasticsearch, um, maybe you have MongoDB, maybe you have InfluxDB for metrics data, whatever. So you have this tag mechanism. So using the tag uh, as the expression, you can decide, okay, this data goes there, this data goes to MongoDB and Elasticsearch, this go data goes only to InfluxDB and so on. In Logstash, you have to write some EFL statements and, and uh, some uh, logic to, to do that. But on the other hand, Logstash is uh, uh, better for uh, routing everything. So all the data comes in and you route everything to uh, every endpoint. You don't have any, you don't need any configuration there. Yeah, brilliant. That's perfect. Um, if you allow Nana, I might run a very quick poll because you know it helps us keep the uh, platform going and all of that. So I'm going to start a poll, folks. You will see something pop up. Just answer. Once half of you have answered, we'll go ahead with more questions. Um, so yeah, this should pop up on your screen. If I can request folks to start answering, that would be brilliant. Cool, we can progress. So yeah, uh, more, more questions are coming in, which is good. So probably uh, following up to the original question around aggregator and the others, Nana. So there's a question by Pavan. And the question is, so when is aggregator uh, needed to be deployed? 
if I have 10 nodes set up, is it okay without an aggregator? Um, I mean, it depends, depends uh, what load uh, you have on those, uh, on those 10 nodes. So if you have a lot of log data and you need uh, reliability and so on, and you also, you also need um, to, to uh, watch for resources, right? So the, the fact is uh, FluentD has actually a lot of, uh, uh, is using up a lot of resources because of the buffering and it and it uh, processes the whole data. So when the parsing and filtering and, and processing the log data is happening, uh, of course, everything is loaded in memory, right? So you have um, uh, one node that logs a lot of stuff, right? Depending on how, how big the node is, how, uh, how many resources it has. So you have one FluentD, on that uh, node, it will pull everything in memory and try to uh, process the, the log data, try to add tags, um, add some, uh, 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 do, do some parsing and so on. So if you have problem well, while Flu FluentD is running um, of running out of memory or some uh, CPU spikes, et cetera, uh, you may need an aggregator because you want to reduce the load on those nodes uh, so what you can do is on each node, you say, okay, the FluentD pods do not do the processing of the logs. They just forward the, the logs directly to the aggregator and the aggregator may run on another node, which has a little bit more resources and that aggregator then does all the processing. So I would say uh, you can start maybe without an aggregator and then see how FluentD performs. If you have any uh, resource issues on those nodes and if you do then maybe try to add um, aggregator. Yeah, that's a good way of going about it. Start without it. And if you see performance spikes, then, you know, add an aggregator. Nice one. Um, oh, this is another good one from Zoran. So the next question is, would you suggest EFK stack logging solution over a cloud native solution logging? For example, Google operations, which is the stack driver, I think. So would you suggest EFK stack logging solution over a cloud native solution? Um, I mean, th that also depends of how much control you need of this stuff. If you don't want to manage uh, the storage, for example, right? Because if you if you are deploying the Elasticsearch inside your cluster, uh, you have to manage it, right? So you have to make sure that the data synchronization happens. You have to make sure the, the data is properly backed up. Uh, you have to connected to the to the storage volumes so i i would say like if you don't need that control and if you'd rather uh kind of delegate the task of managing the storage uh and how the, the like the application runs then it's probably better to go with the cloud solution yeah brilliant and i think one more lens to it sorry if i may nana uh, yep. Another lens to it would be if, let's say, you're running an EFK stack, you would need to run and manage that. Obviously, you get control, but then you have to look after it. <clears throat> but the flip side is if you go with something like Stack Driver or CloudWatch, then your searchability, you have reduced functionality. So it really depends where you want to find a balance. You want to run the thing and have more visibility and more control over how you can search, how you can index things, or you're happy for it to go to CloudWatch or Stack Driver. Generally, the pattern that I have seen um, within organizations, they send it to Stack Driver or CloudWatch and then route it to another managed service like Splunk or Sumo or whatever. Mm -hmm. Cool. So for that, um, <laughs> I can't hold myself back on Kubernetes <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, so the next one is from Karunaka. And the question is, ah, the question is, what is the difference between using Prometheus and EFK? Yeah, that's that's also a common question. Um, so, Prometheus is more for metrics data, right? So you have uh, data on the infrastructure level. Um, in this case, we have abstracted the, this away with Kubernetes. So you have the metrics data of how your infrastructure is performing, right? Are your nodes alive? What is their health status? Um, uh, what is the CPU usage or memory usage, etc. Right? Um, and EFK or ELK is more for application logs, right? So you have uh, 
application logic covered, so to say. Maybe you want to know, uh, does your application throw exceptions, right? What, how many exceptions? Or uh, maybe you want to debug, uh, for example, something, uh, a user got an error in the UI, they don't know what happened. So you may, be, you may want to follow this thread of a request and see like what happened at which time um, in different applications, because obviously when you have this Kubernetes cluster, uh, the request goes through multiple pods, right? You have the ingress controller pod and you have the server, like the, the application, maybe it goes to database, et cetera. So you can follow this thread. So I would say Prometheus for metrics, EFK for uh, logging, um, but I also see that each tool like Prometheus is actually, or a, 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 like, um, uh, ELK, they're both going in, in the other direction as well. So um, Grafana is, uh, for example, has this new tool, uh, Grafana Loki, I think it's called, which mm -hmm. is for logging uh, data visualization. And you can do some metrics uh, uh, collection and visualization with uh, ELK. But again, I would rather use the tool which is meant for uh, some specific thing. So I think the combination of Prometheus for metrics and ELK or EFK for logging works uh, best for now. Yeah, no, yeah, brilliant. No, brilliant. Um, uh, oh, oh. oh, I can hear I myself. Can hear myself. There's, some There's some echo in there. In there. Anyway, I'll yeah. move on to the next question, which is from uh, Danny. Um, so the question is, in Logstash Elastic Kibana setup, we are sometimes not seeing the log messages uh, not showing correctly. Um, in Kibana, but for messages coming from FluentD as user agent is showing messages correctly. So why would we be missing messages? Oh, uh, what do you mean seeing correctly, like parsed correctly, or uh, just seeing them, like have having them uh, in the storage? Yeah, I think it might be talking about the parsing of it. So I'll repeat the question anyway. In in the Logstash Elastic Kibana setup, we are not seeing the log messages showing correctly in Kibana. So I think they're talking yeah. about the parsing and the rendering of it. But messages coming from FluentD as a user agent are showing correctly. Any uh, what you I mean, you could you could actually check uh, directly in Elasticsearch how the data is stored, um, like maybe using a, a command line uh, tool, because it seems like a configuration uh, problem. I mean, you have to configure the, the processing of logs, right, in both tools. So if if they're shown differently in Kibana, that it means that they're stored differently. Cool. Um, the next one is from Michael. And the question is, does Fluentd support auto discovery based on annotations similar to Beats? Um, I don't think so. Um, I have, uh, I have looked that up that feature. I remember when I was, uh, setting up Fluentd and I, I, I don't remember exactly, but I think I couldn't find it. Um, but I'm, I'm not hundred percent sure to be honest. Okay. Cool. That's okay. Um, Next one from Michael as well is, does Fluentd support collection of Prometheus metrics in addition to logs? Uh, yes, you can You can actually collect metrics data for using Fluentd, yeah. And you have the, the uh, support for the um, uh, metrics data endpoints as well, where you can send those data. Brilliant. Um, Next one is not a question, it's just a link from Maiden. Um, which was the next one? Ah, another one from Michael. Ooh, Michael is busy. So can Fluentd support Elasticsearch back pressure and exponential back off like Beats and Logstash do? Um, you can, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can configure that, yes, yeah. Cool. Um, another link from Maiden. I think if you want to post any links, folks, I would request to post it in the chat. Um, moving on to the next question. This is from Kiran. 
Hey, mate. Uh, the question is, what role does Fluentd Logstash play in the managed cluster offerings such as EKS? I assume CloudWatch comes into play and just wondering if Fluentd has a role to play in such a deployment. Thanks. Uh, yes, you can. Like if you're using the hosted um, um, Elasticsearch, Kibana, you can actually replace the uh, the log collect collector part with Fluentd. So you can do that. You can, I mean, you can you can configure Fluentd to to send the data to Elasticsearch endpoint, and that endpoint could be the the hosted uh, endpoint. Of course, yeah. Cool. Probably. Sorry, maybe let me reread it because I might have misread it. I would have said EFK somewhere. So I think the question is more around what role does Fluentd play in the managed cluster offerings like EKS or GKE? Like, what is the role of Fluentd in that sense? Um, okay, I mean, if I understand the question correctly, so Fluentd, so the whole, you have these three components. You have the collecting of the logs which mostly happens on the uh, application level, right? You have to have this in the inside your cluster. And then you have the logging storage. This could be anywhere, obviously, in this case, the, the managed sto uh, storage. And then you have the visualization. So if I understand this correctly, Fluentd is, is going to be the collector of the mm -hmm. logs, and then it can forward it to any managed service. Yeah, and that managed service could be like CloudWatch or Stackdriver, as you. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think it has hundred something backend plugins. So, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure uh, it integrates with most of them. Which is which is um, also um, another thing with Fluentd. So the core is uh, written with uh, with C language, but they had a they they created a wrapper around it with Ruby. Uh, so there are actually a lot of uh, a lot of plugins that created for Fluentd, uh, which are decentralized. So basically, everyone who wants to create another plugin for for Fluentd can create a Ruby plugin or Ruby gem, and you can very easily um, uh, configure on the startup of Fluentd to to install those plugins and to make them available. Mm -hmm. um, and in Logstash, this plugin management is actually more centralized. So you have these uh, plugins managed by Logstash um, and not um, kind of distributed uh, uh, around like like in Fluentd. Brilliant. Um, I might just run another very quick poll if you're okay with it, Nana. Um, yeah. So folks, I'm going to kick off a poll. Just jump on it soon so that we can progress ahead with the questions. So it should be up on your screen if folks can click the answers. We'll wait for half of these to answer. Um, and the question is, in course, the application Java and Node used to generate JSON logs, and those are a bit easy to pass, or it is a bit easy to write passing logging for JSON logs. But what about plain text logs? Do you have any online log parse logic generator for Fluentd? Um, yeah, that's that's also a good question. So uh, there's some built-in parsers in Fluentd. Like JSON is one of one of them. Uh, uh, you also have Nginx, uh, and then you have regular expression parsers. So you have to match like whatever custom um, uh, log format you have, uh, or maybe from some other formats using the regular expression. There is. There is no generator, but there is uh, Fluentd has this UI. It's actually from Fluentd itself, where you can check what your uh, regular expression can match. So you can test your regular expression, so to say. Oh, moving on. To I can actually, I, I can, I can put the link to that uh, tool in the Git repository, so you can, you can check that out. Yeah, I'll that would be brilliant, this. actually, and yeah. maybe we can flick the link here as well. Yeah. Next one is a nice one from Muzaffar. And the question is, what is your upcoming course, Nana? What will be your upcoming course? Uh, <laughs> I have I have a lot of them uh, planned, actually. One that I definitely want to do is complete CI-CD pipeline. Um, 
we like obviously this is going to be like a the, the bigger one but with the tools that are most popular like you have different categories like you have the build tool you have the docker repository uh regist like re docker storage the registry you have the uh, deployment uh platform so i'm gonna choose like the most popular ones in the in each category like jenkins uh, nexus aws terraform and do like a complete ci cd um and i have i have some other ones as well uh, so I, I don't really know in which uh, order this will come but they're going to be github actions full tutorial also for the ci cd um prometheus with like alert manager configuration and so on so a lot oh, of nice. things planned but less time <laughs> yeah nice nice i would also i mean if i may would love to see something around flux cd um if there is a course or whatever i think that would be good as well the gitops new gitops mm -hmm. um, ways of deploying yeah. nice if you don't mind i might ask just one quick question from my sure. end i know i i don't know for some odd reason i can't post questions but that's okay because i have the mic <laughs> so <laughs> the question that i have is uh, one of the problems i've uh, faced or have encountered is in on the cluster sometimes some of your applications can log kind of like a sensitive data. Um, so for instance, if you have username or, you know, their phone number or email or whatever, they can log it. Is there a way to prevent that going into the outbound system using Fluentd? Like, can you extract that kind of information somehow? Yes, you can, uh, like you can uh, write a regular expression to, to match these kind of logs um, and you can, kind of disregard them or or throw them away yeah i mean okay. you should actually you should yeah. configure that yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> um and is that more of a you can uh, you can redact them or you can mask them what's the way in fluentd uh like the way um we have configured that in projects was that just match uh the the logs with password, for example, or some sensitive information, and uh, just discard them um, or not do not process them so they don't even end up in Elasticsearch. Uh, the, the question is why or in, in which case you need it. And like, for example, if, if uh, you need to do auditing in your application, you can actually send the logs directly so, to some audit uh, the, like backend. So not through the through the standard output, for example, but direct maybe right directly to um, um, audit database or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Um, and probably another question, and um, I promise after this I'll go on to the actual questions. Um, so in case of self-managed Kubernetes, like when we are managing masters and the others, um, is there a way to let's say? segregate the stream of logs. So for instance, if I have my masters producing logs, um, can I segregate them to my usual container logs and have like two streams? You know how traditionally they're like indexes in Splunk or would I have to uh, forward all the logs uh, to Elastic as one unit? Uh, you mean to, to, to divide the logs like yes. from master and, and to send it where to another uh, uh, backend to another, to another backend yeah yes yes of course you can do you can do this kind of routing uh, pretty easily in Fluentd so you you basically uh, for example in case of master nodes right you you make Fluentd pods run on the master nodes so they co collect all the data you can tag them so each log coming from the master pods uh, containers you can tag them with master dot blah, blah, something. And then you can uh, match that uh, master.star and say all these logs will go to some other database. You can do that wow. pretty easily in Fluentd, actually. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'll go back to the questions then. So the next one is from Karnakar again. Uh, so the question is, I've been following your, oh, this more of a, yeah, okay. I've been following your channel, great content. So kudos. Um, it would be great if you could talk about some real life challenges in production with Kubernetes. Okay, that's more of a request than a question, but I don't know if you want to answer or respond. 
Um, I mean, it, it uh, depends on uh, scenario, depends on how complex your application. It also depends where uh, on which actual infrastructure you're running Kubernetes, right? Uh, if you're running on, on bare metal, of course, you have other challenges uh, if you're running on AWS, but self-managed, like you are running the master nodes yourself as well. Uh, you have some other issues if you're using a managed Kubernetes uh, service, then of course, I mean, th there's always a trade-off, right? Uh, you have more control, but, uh, um, uh, but also more uh, like responsibility and effort to manage the whole whole thing, especially when the master nodes are involved. Um, mm -hmm. So it really it really depends. Like because because there are issues related to master nodes uh, or master processes. But if you if you kind of delegate that to the managed Kubernetes service, then you have less of them or or none of them. So oh. it really depends. Yeah, nice one, which I think segues into one next poll that I want to run. And I'll quickly fire up this poll. Um, and this is around what tech topics you would uh, like us to cover next time. So this could be one of the tech topics, like real life um, Kubernetes, uh, you know, uh, lessons. So folks, if you can answer this very quickly, and while we're waiting for folks to answer, probably shameless plug. <laughs> I do have on the Meetup Madness uh, uh, YouTube channel, there will be a talk that I did a few, I think months ago on lessons learned while running Kubernetes in production. So maybe if you want to check that out, <laughs> that was a shameless plug. I know, I know. That sounds interesting though. That's, yeah. That's a really good, good topic. Yeah, it is. I've actually I talked about it at a conference as well, which was, I didn't, I didn't, Initially, before that talk, I didn't think people would like it, but man, the response mm -hmm. was awesome. Cool. All right, probably let's power through some of the next questions. So the next question is uh, from Anuj. Um, and the question is, what is the significance of discovery seed host in Elasticsearch? Uh, just, can you give me just a second? So. I just um, edit the link as well. Um, so I'll repeat probably please, what, please. what is the significance of discovery seed host in Elasticsearch? Um, I don't really get the question. Can you maybe uh, make it more specific? Uh, what yeah. do you mean about the yeah, significance? Probably a question to Anuj, if you can add more details to it around it in the chat, mate, so we'll get Nana to answer it. Um, until then, we'll move on to the next one. That is from Kedarnath. Uh, the question is, does EFK support tracing like Yega? Uh, you have, you can look up the plugin. I mean, um, the, the FluentD, you have this uh, list of uh, input and output plugins. so. If it's uh, on the list, then yes, but I haven't used it, so I don't know. Yeah, and probably a cheeky way of using tracing in your logging system is whenever whenever you log something, uh, use uh, UUIDs or like GUIDs to log against those and pass those GUID around in the call chain. So if let's say you have three applications which call each other sequentially, pass a GUID in the header and use that GUID to log. So when you are looking in Elastic, you can search by that GUID and you will get a trace. But that's a cheeky that's, way to yeah, do it. Yeah, that's, 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 uh, that's a very good one, exactly. Yeah, especially if you're tracing like uh, um, a request and you want to know like where something happened if that request, uh, for example, had some issue, um, yeah. you, can, you can find that with a tracing ID, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah that's a cheeky mm -hmm. way of doing tracing if you, using logging. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Next one is from Kedarnath again, and the question is more around what is the difference between managed and self-managed gates? Um, so the the main difference, the major one, is that you have to manage uh, master nodes in um, self-managed Kubernetes cluster. Again, this could be a bare metal infrastructure, or it could also be cloud one, right? You can uh, actually have a self-managed cluster on AWS. So 
Um, again, the question is how much control you need over your master nodes. Um, how, if you have, for example, in big com companies, I, I think this also makes sense because you have a dedicated team, um, maybe IT operations team in this case, not DevOps necessarily, that is gonna take care of the servers, that is gonna take care of uh, uh, backing up the etcd store, um, that is gonna make sure that the master nodes are replicated and so on, maybe in different regions. Uh, in managed cluster, of course, you have most of this out of the box, right? So uh, when you create a EKS cluster in AWS, you have the master nodes automatically in um, uh, in all the availability zones in the region. Um, and of course, the, the backing up and replication of the ETCD is happening uh, and so on. So you can rely more on it um, and kind of take care of the work nodes. Uh, also, there is uh, there is a higher level, I guess, because um, uh, in some cloud provider um, Kubernetes services, you also have the worker nodes semi managed, so to say. For example, on on the Linode Kubernetes uh, um, engine, uh, the, you get the worker nodes out of the box when you create the cluster. You just have to choose like how many and which resources and you have docker pre-installed you have the kubernetes processes pre-installed so you don't have to do any of those on the on the on the worker nodes as well uh, so i would say if you're just starting off with kubernetes uh, if you don't want to know and understand how the architecture works and how to install the binaries it's, uh, and so uh, and also if you have a smaller project um, i think the easiest way is to start with Maybe Linodes or DigitalOcean's um, uh, uh, managed uh, Kubernetes service. If you need more control, most of the companies, uh, bigger projects and bigger companies, that's why they choose AWS because you have more control over your infrastructure, worker nodes, um, um, or if you want to self manage the whole thing, uh, you can do that as well. Brilliant. That was brilliant. Okay, uh, so folks, uh, final call out because uh, we will um, we are approaching seven pm. So if you have any final burning questions, pop them in the question uh, space, and we will look to close these off. Um, so the next one um, is from Michael again. Nana, uh, can Fluentd use disk-based persistence to ensure no data lost? Is it recommended to deploy Fluentd as stateful set in this case? Uh, FluentD can uh, use this space, but I mean, it is uh, uh, it is meant to be used this way. Um, I would, I mean, if you if you deploy it as a stateful set, then you have to make sure that uh, let's say you have three nodes, right, and then you add a fourth worker node. You have to make sure that you scale the stateful set uh, on four replicas so that the FluentD pod also starts on that fourth node, right? With daemon said, you have that automatically, right? So mm -hmm. you have Fluentd running on every work node because uh, it collects the logs like from the from the file system, from Docker um, um, uh, log storage, so to say. Um, and this disk-based persistence is actually one of the advantages of, of using Fluentd uh, because um, as I mentioned previously, whenever, you, so the, the forwarder um, gets the, logs right so the, the event stream and it immediately persists that on a disk uh, before even trying to um, send that to to the backend storage backend so if something happens between the the time if fluentd dies maybe after uh, the logs were persisted maybe the elastic search is not available or some other backend you have the the data uh, on disk so you don't lose any any uh, any of it so when a fluentd comes back up or the backend becomes available, you can just read it from the disk and then uh, send it to backend. So you, it is actually um, um, a good practice to use that. And you can configure you can configure all of this in um, uh, in the Fluentd configuration file uh, per backend. So you can say, for example, when uh, the the or how big the buffer should be, when it should be flushed. Um, so that you have some control over um, how long it's stored um, and so on. Yeah, nice one. Brilliant. Um, and probably last 
few questions. So the next one is from Kiran again. Um, and it starts with a sorry, so it's probably not a question. So sorry. Uh, so the question question is, sorry, this is a generic question and not related to EFK. I see many courses online related to Kubernetes, such as Prometheus, Elk, et cetera, which are very basic in nature. How do we take our skills to next level, such as advanced level? Uh, probably yeah. a spin on that, Nana, is like, yeah, what's the, if people want to advance their skills, what's, what, what is the progression? How do they go on doing that? Um, that that's a that's a very good one actually uh, because that's true that most of the course cover the basics so that you understand the concepts. The I mean the best recipe for that is just trying out yourself, but also not trying some some uh, like um, test projects or some uh, unrealistic projects. For example, what uh, what I did uh, when I started learning uh, AWS um, some years ago, I actually took uh, a project, a real project, which was dockerized. And I said, you know what, I'm, uh, I will try to deploy this on Kubernetes cluster on AWS. So both tools were new to me. I didn't know Kubernetes, I didn't know AWS. And just having this complex dockerized application and trying to uh, actually find use cases and try to deploy that in Kubernetes cluster, you learn a lot of realistic use cases, right? you know, like, what are the challenges? What are the actual use cases? What you might want to do? And then things don't work. And then you debug and you research and and, and do this kind of stuff. So this is, I think, the most effective way of learning, uh, learning the tools. Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree. More, pra more practice you get, more you learn. But I will make a shameless plug. Do come to this meetup session. <laughs> Here we talk about Kubernetes a lot. So you might be able to learn something about the advanced level. Um, sorry, that was a shameless plug. <laughs> Moving on to the next one. Um, and this is the last of two. Um, so this one is from Sampad. The question is, uh, I have a general, I have a question in KH general. Consider, for example, I created an object and running a resource, which is a beta version. And on the next case, upgrade the version has changed for the resource. Does it automatically upgrade version on my running resource? So wait a minute, I have to read the game. So the question is, if you yeah. if you deploy a resource, let's say you make a create a deployment object and the API mm -hmm. version for that is beta. And in in the next Kubernetes version upgrade, let's say that dip, uh, that deployment resource has graduated to a GA or it has gone V1, would the running resource be automatically updated to the new version? Okay, so you mean if the if the um, the configuration uh, file needs to be adjusted or not? Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember if we had some cases. I think you need, you need to update the uh, configuration file and rerun uh, the resource. Yeah, uh, in yeah, my experience as well. Change because I mean you have the you have the configuration stored in the etcd and it's mm -hmm. not going to be overwritten uh, when you upgrade Kubernetes. So um, you will have to. I mean, when you when you do the upgrade, well, the the pods are down, so you will have to up, update the configuration. Um, change the version and then rerun uh, the, the pod. Yeah, spot on. And I think in my experience as well, uh, they don't generally deprecate a version in just one release. They let you, uh, they, they, they push forward a deprecation notice and it might be a couple of versions after that it gets deprecated. Um, and yes, Nana is absolutely right. You would have to update your YAML or configuration object. Cool. That was a nice one. And probably the last one is from Manish, uh, which is, will I get charged on Linode while doing the hands-on course? Uh, yes, uh, but in the link, uh, you have the, like if you are a new user on, on Linode, you get this uh, um, uh, credit, I guess, uh, for $100. So, it's not going to be like if, if you try the course, uh, it's not going to be more than $100. So you can probably do that uh, within that range. So no, <laughs> I guess with that, with that credit, no. Okay. No, brilliant. 
I think that's all the questions. And I think there was one pending from Anuj, which I didn't see any more details about. So probably we will leave it at that. Um, but yeah, these are all the questions. Uh, and yeah, this is brilliant. I, I definitely learned a lot more about Fluentd as well. Like there were a few questions, which was, I was like, Ooh, interesting. I never thought about that. But yeah, I'm really actually very happy that I was able to to answer uh, most of it. I mean, some some of the questions um, um, I see that a lot as well, like comparison with Logstash or Prometheus and stuff. So um, I'm happy that I um, helped and cleared some of your doubts. You can also like if you have some other technical uh, questions or some other questions regarding the course, you can also uh, write them in the in the course Q and A part. Um, I always check them and uh, try to answer them as well. So, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. So this was brilliant. Thank you very much, Nana. That was a good session. And really, thanks to folks as well. There were so many questions. And I think you did fabulous. You answered them all. Um, and in style, like there wasn't even <laughs> one question which we weren't able to cover completely, other than the one that is missing some details. But yeah, no, that was good. And, and folks, um, uh, send any messages to Nana, as she said, on the course Q&A if you still have any further question. But yep. I think we can wrap it here. Thank you very much for your time, Nana. Thank you. Thank you for hosting and having me. Cool. I'll Thanks, quickly... Nana. Hopefully this is not the last time, you know, that we will have you. So 